Bill Joy was one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems. He once said that no matter who you are, most of the smartest people in the world work for someone else. This became known as Joy's Law. Now, I do not know whether the seed of this story is urban legend or not, but think about Joy's Law. It has to be right. No matter how good you are, how good the team that you work for, how good or big a company you work for, there will always be more people outside your team, group or company that are smarter than you. And here's the important bit, capable of doing more than you. For me, the power of Joy's Law is not the obvious aspect of who owns the most knowledge. It is the aspect that if that knowledge and people holding that knowledge were aggregated together, they could achieve great things. That is a powerful concept. Today's episode is about open source software development. In the past few decades, we have seen a plethora of open source software solutions becoming part and parcel of our professional lives. At the heart of it, open source is about making the fundamental product that you are developing unrestricted so it can be accessed and utilized by everyone. That access to the development and use of that software is not behind some onerous and expensive paywall. In essence, it is the democratization of it to anyone interested in doing something with it. Now, there are a lot of opinions out there on the open source movement. Sometimes the open source was paid software battle seems a little bit like the iPhone and Android battle. You have to belong to one side or the other. You cannot like both. When I look at the open source software movement, the obvious thing that stands out to me is the extension of Joy's Law. It is the avenue of aggregating all of that capability sitting in people and channeling it to a common goal. That, if done right, is a powerful thing. Our guest today is Evren Pakhuyu Sharier, lead geologist at Oslandia. Oslandia is a company that specializes in developing open source GIS software. Evren is looking to develop bespoke open source GIS solutions for the exploration mining industry through QGIS, the largest open source GIS software platform. If you are a user of QGIS, then you might want to have a listen to what Evren and Oslandia can do for you. My name is Ahmad, and this is Exploration Radio. Welcome to Exploration Radio. Thank you for having me. So, Evren, can you talk a little bit about your background? Are you a geologist? Are you a developer? What hat do you consider yourself to be wearing most of the time? Well, I'm a bit of an, an oddball. By training, I'm a mining geologist. I was trained at the uh, OSUC, that is Orléans Bay, so that's in France. It's the basically the BRGM school, so that's the French Geological Survey School, and it's one of the last places in Europe where you can be taught mining geology. And uh, I did my bachelor and master's uh, over there, worked for a while at the survey, itself. And then I moved on as I saw a good opportunity to join Mark Jessel's team at the Center for Exploration Targeting in, uh, in Perth. So that was U- UWA to uh, pursue a PhD in uh, 3D geological modeling. Uh, that was, you know, an uncertainty estimation uh, for these uh, implicit uh, 3D models. And uh, sorry to interrupt you, but just to uh, make a comment there. So this, so at UWA is when you and I first met, uh, yeah. because we shared an office together, although mm-hmm, very briefly, right. because I was hardly in my office uh, most of the days. So are most PhD students, honestly, we kind of that's uh, right. exactly, yeah. and that's how PhD students should be. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, with that said, usually didn't like mornings quite well. Tended to, you know, overwork at night, write yeah, some code sorry. that doesn't make sense. Midnight, 1 a.m., and then I have to fix it. <laughs> yeah, day. that's right. And there were some uh, epic meltdowns when your code couldn't work, but but that's all part of parcel of the process. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's part of, uh, uh, you know, when you're on your, these type of projects where there's a lot of R&D and you have to basically be writing code for about a year and a half to maybe two years and you don't have anything to show for yourself because you're in the process of building the tool to be able to demonstrate that your ideas make sense so that that indeed creates quite a a bit of pressure as well you don't know uh, until you've put in all the effort you can't cut your losses or pull back midway through because by definition there is no way to uh, to figure it out at that point uh, with that said, that is indeed during my PhD that I kind of moved a lot more into, um, I, I didn't 
it's not I'm I'm not a software developer, but I got a lot more involved into uh, uh, software, let's say, in in general and software engineering. And that is, for example, when I actually I was uh, I switched from Arc. I'll say it. I'll say the the boogeyman's. No, I, I I switched from Arc to Cube, even though we had free licenses at UWI because I needed to get the job done. It was too slow. It was too clunky, and I never looked back. Uh, uh, really since then. I had tried it before and it was a mess. Uh, that was in back in my bachelor years and I had tried it uh, since then. But yeah, when I switched to it back in 2016, I said, all right, now it's fit for purpose. It's, uh, it's ready. It's industry grade. I'll use that. It's less trouble. And uh, that's when I first started being interested in open source because you see, we all are users of open source. You can bet money that uh, taking any person's computer if they're running code that is uh, less than 40 years old, 90% of all software is uh, actually open source because there is no real, most of proprietary software nowadays, just a layer of proprietary code on top of open source libraries at the end of the day. It started real noticing basically the open source endeavor. It's called, it's not just a community. And that, you know, I had just been a kind of an oblivious user. It's free, I'll just use it. It's kind of convenient and, and, and that's it. And I started to be more interested at the time had to, you know, you know, you, you've got a job to do, kept on, on working on it, but I kept that at the back of my head. And I thought it'd be nice if Q just had more, you know, tools for the geologist, uh, any kind of geologist. My idea was not, you know, that one specific task in this one instance, a, a plugin would be nice, which can be done, but just making it more fit for purpose for the general idea of a geologist. You're going to the field, you're going to do some mapping, you want That's to uh, you want to visualize specific types of data. The initial seed of QGIS was actually just, uh, you know, we should we should maybe explain what QGIS is for people that don't understand. Uh, you know, it is a, a, a GIS um, a software package. And yeah, and its roots were really around using it for more like spatial mapping and things like that. So it wasn't specifically a tool built you know, per se for the mining or exploration industry. It was just a no. generic GIS tool that was built. And obviously most geologists use a lot of spatial data sets. So hence they almost always use a GIS program or a software package. Um, and yeah, up until QGIS, most of these programs were proprietary and, you know, like depending on what view you have on proprietary software, like, yeah, they were either very expensive or really, really expensive. Yeah, especially at the time. Yeah, at the time of the inception of QGIS, uh, GIS was extraordinarily expensive because licenses are pretty much the same in terms of, uh, uh, of cost, the figure, it's pretty similar. Uh, but that was 20, 20, 30 years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, inflation came in. It actually means that, you know, the costs have, have come down. And part of it is pressure from uh, open source industry and also the fact that it's become much easier to develop software in general. Like in the early 80s, uh, lots of software specialized, let's say, software, because even generalist GIS software was a, considered a specialized software. That's Most right. of these software were prohibitively expensive for two reasons. One, the upfront cost of developing them had to be borne by these uh, companies. They had just developed it. So they had to try and, and, and recoup their initial uh, investment. And also tools, development tools were just not at the level they're at now. There was no way to develop as quickly as we can today when you see what people can whip out in a, in a couple of weeks with, uh, with uh, Python and other uh, you know, types of high-level languages. You had to do so much of that very low level uh, level uh, development uh, close to the machine. And nowadays you just pull some dependencies and this is all done in the background. So overall, it was a lot more expensive to develop uh, code and that's pretty normal. So at the time, I don't consider that, for example, purchasing these, uh, you know, proprietary GIS package was a mistake. There was no other alternative really at the time. And it made sense that it would start that way. Now, QG started actually, if you go back to the history of QG, QG started off kind of as a, before QG was GRASS. So GRASS GIS, which still technically exists. And it was made by the Army Corps of Engineers, US Army Corps of Engineers, as a matter of fact. So it's, uh, 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 and generally speaking, the Army Corps of Engineers has produced a lot of open source code. And the idea of at the time was, well, we've made this code at the beginning, it's kind of semi-confidential, you know, it's like technology. And then as the civilian side of GIS developed further, it's, like it's less critical. Let's 
uh, let's open this up. Public money goes into public code. I'm a proponent of that. It's uh, in the US, it's rarely the case, but let's say that in in this instance, it it worked. And Grass was the foundation of QGIS. QGIS was built as a way to have a, a proper a UI, a proper user interface, you know, with buttons and menus to, to Grass. It started off this way. Now, the contribution of Grass into the current QGIS is much less than it used to be. And it has become its own, its own application. And there's only a couple things that depend on Grass. But currently, when you're installing QGIS, you're also installing Grass. Uh, it's still there for a couple couple algorithms uh, are still being in use. There's a few things along the way that like, you know, kind of changed. Uh, you know, like A, there was this development of more a need to to actually utilize spatial data sets as well. Like, you know, with the advent of, of, of satellites, with the advent of, uh, you know, GPS, things like that, it became really important that you needed to then have a GIS software that allowed allowed you to manipulate that data more and more. Uh, yeah, like if you just look at also the, the advent of particularly mineral exploration, like the advent of geophysics surveys and things like that, you know, like that obviously grew airborne geophysics surveys, et cetera. So all of this kind of led to the point where maybe these programs started off as being a very general GIS program, but they had to become more and more specialized, not just in um, in mineral exploration or oil exploration or something like that, but also in civilian uses, like, you know, how... Uh, city planners used it or how they would do demographics or, um, you know, like all of these type of things, like traffic management became a huge component of how to use GIS software. And, and I think if you follow that line all the way to now, like, you know, like basically any app, like, you know, like food delivery apps and things like that, you know, they're all using some component of spatial kind of uh, oh. GIS, mm -hmm. um, you know, like engine in the back to kind of show you where you are. And so my point here is that, yeah, like even though it started off as probably a very general tool developed by the U.S. Army, it actually had to then go through this evolution of becoming more and more specialized for different industries. It wasn't just a general product that could be applied to everyone that wanted to use it. Well, yeah, I mean, it turned out that you had both phenomena happen at the same time. Uh, you had general base and then lots and lots of very specific algorithms that then are uh, going to aggregate onto it. And then it regeneralizes itself. So that's kind of like the development uh, the development cycle. You've got basically uh, growth spurts uh, where you specialize the software in a certain way. And then you've, you, you're going to have cycles where you're going to kind of level off, uh, you know, kind of try and, and, and average, uh, average things out. Now, when it comes to the reason why GS has become more prevalent in our lives in general, I mean, you know, the easiest way indeed is to say, well, just uh, pull out your phone, look at Google Maps, that's a GIS software for you. That's it. It's that you want to geolocalize something. And indeed, the democratization of geospatial data, the access to geospatial data, which, uh, you know, you could say, oh, in the 70s, you already had spy satellites that technically did that job. And like, well, yeah, okay. But, the, you know, yeah. the acquisition cost was somewhere up there and you could not have access to it. Nowadays, yeah. these things, they're just available to everyone and, uh, and anyone and that was one of the reasons why it started becoming a large opportunity, uh, a major opportunity for open source developers. It took a while to get there, mostly because, you know, if you, if you consider open source, the beginning of open source, I mean, you can, you can go, of course, you can say in the, in, in the early 70s, you already had examples of open source code, but I mean, having something organized. I'd, I like to use the uh, first version of the Linux kernel as like a, a starting point. Obviously, you had plenty of software. The definition of software had already been established. The Free Software Foundation was already in existence and, 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 and so forth. But 1991 is the first version of the uh, Linux kernel. 1991. So it's recent. And sometimes, you know, people wonder, well, this software has been there for a long, for a while. Why is this software, you know, only, you know, showing up now? And it's, yeah, that's well, at the beginning, we had to make uh, your uh, mouse and your keyboard and your printer and your, and your screen work. Okay. Uh, we were not going to dive into GIS software. Uh, so that's the reason is that it took a while to develop this. If you compare it to the amount of time it took to start in the 60s, with the very first computers, you know, perforated cards and everything. It took about a similar, actually, it took less time, as a matter of fact, because you could leverage the know-how and the development tools rather than the code that were already uh, in place uh, at the time. 
And now that we've come to a point where essentially the tide, I like to call it that way, the tide of open source development is now able to reach pretty much any, any height at that point. So you start off with a very basic groundwork, get the memory and the CPU to work properly, get the bus to work properly, you're really in the hardware. And now we've gone to the point where there's an open source version of everything. And that's because of the fact that now you can basically, that's the beauty of open source, you can endlessly leverage what has been produced earlier. So all that groundwork is not locked up behind bars in a black box. Or paywall or something Or paywall. Like that. And therefore you have that constant evolution. You always able to 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 keep going so QGIS, for example relies on things like proj and gdal gdal is the uh, raster driver allows you to import export rasters which is one of the fortes of QGIS, is to be able to basically uh, absorb any kind of data and then uh, convert it into anything else gdal is a low level c++ library that's being used that's used in plenty of software including proprietary software that instead of having to redevelop anything so open source has this growth effect on the whole of the software uh, development industry, including proprietary industry. That is essential. I mean, the, the, the number one users uh, of open source code are going to be, uh, you know, Microsoft and Google and, and Amazon and Facebook. They're the ones that contribute the most to open source projects in terms of funding and in terms of actual code contributions. And they're also the ones that are the, the greatest users of, of mm -hmm. that technology, even though the end product for the user might be proprietary, just know that you're using open source as a matter of fact, mostly. Yeah, like when you look at, I guess, kind of the difference between proprietary software and say open source software, yeah, in a lot of ways, proprietary software, the evolution of proprietary software really only happens at the start. And then after that, it really becomes, in, in my opinion, anyways, a game of maintenance. You know, like you got to maintain that that product as long as possible so you can then get the payback for all the the stuff that you had to do at the start yeah there's two reasons well one is that when you from the perspective of a user uh and i tell that as a as an ex product owner of a proprietary software it was my time at a, a intrepid prior to, to joining us Landia. Yeah, i was the one in charge of uh leading the development of GeoMod. I was not a developer myself, but I was the one who was basically doing some of the product ownership role, which is defining the features that should make it into the next release, where we should focus our efforts on what the developers should do, and also interfacing with clients based on their feedback, you know, and 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 uh, and also training and, 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 and stuff like that. And during that time, I can tell you one thing. as it, When you're using a proprietary software, any proprietary software, it doesn't really matter if it's geospatial or not. And you're paying a license every year, whatever the format, what you're doing at the end of the day is that you're paying rent, all right? Now, you might tell me, well, it's not just pure rent. I'm paying for the maintenance of this software. I'm paying for the R&D attached to this software and, and, and this and that. But I'll tell you, if you contribute to uh, software development, well, that's what you're doing too. So the, uh, the idea behind it is that when you generate feedback to a proprietary software vendor and you're an existing user, and you've been using that software for a while, your feedback will be ignored unless it's critical and it's something that, you know, bricks your computer, like some kind of critical bug crash. Yeah, it has or, to be some, catastrophic. Kind it of has thing to be catastrophic to that, right? so that, yeah. And the reason why it's not is because the, the feedback that we're going to take into account in the, I mean, when you're in the proprietary industry, the feedback you're going to take into account is feedback of prospective clients because you're trying to endlessly gain new clients to add onto your, onto your product. And because that product is closed source, nobody can see what's going on in there. You end up with feature creep very quickly because you're always trying to impress the next prospective client. You're always reacting to their feedback. Mm -hmm. And it also means that if you are a niche user of a widely used software package, like general is GIS software, and you only represent less than 3% of the market, you are ignored in general, even as a prospective client, you're right. going to be ignored. You don't represent enough compared to government, uh, you know, government agencies and uh, civil engineering, the case of, uh, of GIS uh, packages. So because of that, you're effectively paying a pure rent. You're not actually funding any R&D or any maintenance that is relevant to your use case. Effectively, the money that you pay to, like, to have the license, all you're really doing 
you know, you're not getting any value for return for that really, right? Well, because unless you're a user base that's high enough for the company to go, okay, uh, Evren, you are one of the eight people that use this software the same way. So we're going to build a feature that applies to all eight of you. But if you're the other two, you know, like you're just hanging on, hoping that the other eight have the same problem you do. Exactly. You cross your fingers. You hope that next version will fix this. And as a matter of fact, I've heard that numerous times. We hope the next version will fix this. And it's just, we hope. It's like you're praying to the gods. It's like that subservient relationship between the vendor and, uh, uh, or whether we should call them the landlord and the tenant, essentially. That's At I... this point, all that you're doing is that you have no agency, essentially. Open source provides you that agency back because in open source, you're directly funding research and development or you could mm -hmm. fund uh, you this, this bug. I want this bug fixed. You can just walk up, if it's in QGIS, for example, but it doesn't really matter what kind of uh, open source package we're thinking of, as long as it's active. You can walk up to uh, whoever is uh, in charge of developing it or spending some time developing it and tell them, I want this fixed. How much does it cost to get it fixed? How many days? You know, there's different ways of putting these contracts together. But the point is you can directly finance the engineering itself. Also, open source companies, because of that, tend to be a lot more competitive and a lot more on edge, basically, because your code is open, somebody can always fork your solution. And you might think, well, it kind of divides the attention of people. Not so much. Usually people will, you know, humans are creatures of their habits. They'll stay on that one, on that one solution, but it might outperform it. And if you look at, there's, a, there's a, something that's really nice to, to have a look at is the, uh, all the Linux distribution uh, over the years as they appeared. And it looks like uh, an evolution, the tree of life. It looks like the evolution tree where some things, you know, they, they, they can persist. Uh, and for example, you've got these three main branches. You've got Red Hat, you've got, you've got Debian as the main and uh, as, the, as the, the big main, you know, roots, starting roots. They're still, they're still around, by the way. And then you've got more or less successful offspring. And Ubuntu is a very successful offspring that has itself many offspring, but many of these offspring die and, and all recombine and everything. That's right. And, and you don't have this effect in proprietary software development because yeah. of the way the IP is handled. It's impossible. Correct. So this is my point about like in proprietary software, the incentive for the, the developer is really to maintain all these branches irrespective of whether they are the best branch or not, right? So it's more about trying to maintain your product as long as possible. Yeah, you're milking it at some point. At the beginning, you have a point where you actually are uh, developing features that make sense. You need to enter the market yep. to actually make your product appealing in some ways. Or fill a market niche or whatever you need to do at the start. And, and then that's the evolution exactly. part, right? Like you go off into a new base, you then... You you know, develop something so it occupies that. But then it's all about trying to maintain that market share or that market space or as long as possible. Yes, exactly. And uh, one thing about proprietary versus open source software development is that uh, in proprietary software development companies, a manager managerial structure is heavy. They're top heavy uh, structures. Very quickly, the development team becomes a minority in the company, which makes no sense when you think about it. Whereas in open source development, that doesn't work this way because we don't have that luxury. No, no, no. So, so I like I, I kind of challenge like you know to me it actually makes a lot of sense on why yeah you know, like proprietary companies early on have a greater ratio of developers to say like so simply something like a marketing people and salespeople, right? So at the start of a proprietary company, obviously your incentive or your value is in developing things. So, you know, so you'll have a lot more developers, but say you develop a product that has like 90% of the market share. I mean, what's your incentive to continue developing products when you already own 90% of the market share? The incentive becomes more sales and marketing. I can give you the incentive is that this is what's happening with, for example, with Esri and, and, uh, and, uh, and Arxis and with QGIS is that you are making yourself more and more vulnerable oh, uh, to a disruption that you can't handle. For example, usually what happens when you get to 90% of the market share, you try to diversify yourself. Usually, I mean, to get to that 90% actually, most of the things you'll have to do is to buy up competition. You have to buy them in. Correct. And you have to create a monopoly. That's the only way to get there. But in software, what what, what this leads to is uh, what I like to refer to as Franken software. Because invariably, you'll think, oh, yeah, they have lots of valuable IP in there. We're just going to right. break, graft it onto our main solution, redo some branding, and people won't even people won't even notice. Obviously, people will notice because of the dramatic decrease in performance. It will become a clunky application because you're trying to, you know, uh, to force 
weld two completely different materials in a sense you're trying to get two software that probably had very different architecture technology languages and philosophy or maybe even just like direction right yeah like philosophy direction like you know they were built for completely exactly. different things but now you're putting you know you're putting a you know like a truck body on a motorcycle chassis because you go hey they both get people to the end product it's like well no, no they were built for two fundamentally different reasons exactly that's what happens by the way in uh, in, in arc arc you've got lots of tools that have the same name that's because, well, they were basically tools from companies, startups that were bought up by a friend and grafted into the main solution. And that's why they have four or five different types of APIs and you don't understand why, which makes third-party development a nightmare because you never know which one you're supposed to use. Or which one will hang around or which one might get cut or which might... And, and that's one of the stuff. reasons why you end up more, more, more top heavy. I challenge the idea that you need to have the management structure. Of course, the ma at the very beginning, you usually just have a team of developers in the really early stages, like the first year or two. You have a team of developers and maybe one or two uh, guys to direct it all. And it will increase eventually, if only for legal reasons. You, there's at some point mm -hmm. some types of, uh, of, of jobs that will uh, uh, have to be uh, filled. But you also get to that point where you see once you've signed in uh, as a proprietary vendor, you've signed in contracts over five years, 10 years, uh, if you get into uh, the hand of the, you know, the pocket of the military, you get, <laughs> get 20 years contracts. Here's the issue. You have a team that is supposed to maintain and develop software and you have guaranteed income also. That is the opposite of an incentive. Yeah. And therefore, right. you, the company is has this kind of guaranteed rent that's coming in. And you end up with the same case of an owner that's not maintaining their property because they're in a city Correct. where yeah. there is not enough housing. Or, or just like you can say that, well, what's our main competitor? Like, yeah, if people don't want to use a product, what other product will they use? Uh, if you go like... Because you bought up the con competition. And, yeah, exactly. So, and this is where open source disruption comes in. I don't like the term disruption because often it's used by, uh, you know, uh, Silicon Valley startups that are essentially trying to cheat the tax man. Essentially, usually the disruption is about that. We found a way around the law to actually, uh, you know, funnel money out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, out of the uh, the government. Everyone, if the, if the tax, if people didn't do that, you know, venture capital, the whole system wouldn't work, right? I mean, that's the whole concept of venture capital. Is, ah, that's true. Yeah, is, You're uh, right, maybe. Like uh, tax, tax subsidized investments Absolutely. Uh, for as long as possible. But when it comes to open source, it's a technological, it's a technology and a philosophical disruption in the sense that, uh, what you're doing is that you can't be bought up. You've created a, a, a catch-22 situation for uh, uh, these kind of companies that uh, that that are used to being able to do that. You know, we just buy them up when they start becoming an issue, and it doesn't work suddenly because it's not possible to get this going. And obviously, open source solutions start as like a scrawny little piece of software that don't do all that much. Uh, and some of them, one out of uh, a, a thousand, will actually blow up and become a QGIS like. Just so you know, QGIS has about 400 active developers every month. That's one of the largest open source projects in the world. And the Linux kernel is the largest software development project ever. It has about 7,000 contributors. Yeah, wow. Many of them I work for proprietary software development companies. The number one contributors are going to be the the GAFAMs, the Google, the, the Amazon, the Facebooks. They have a strong incentive into that. Yeah, like just to temper our kind of discussion, like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with kind of the, the, the proprietary development because I think there's stuff that always comes out that, that can then get used by people and go in. You know, like my point in kind of starting this vein of discussion was really around the fact that I actually think that if you philosophically look at kind of the incentive structure, yeah, like proprietary is really about build once, maintain forever. Yep. And open source is really about continuously evolve, continuously kind of build to see how it can kind of get, uh, how, like what can become. And, and like you said, like, you know, the branches of the tree, right? Like, how do we know that this trunk is the best one? What if the that branch that goes and becomes bigger is actually going to dominate and, and then go from that yeah, point? Absolutely. I think a different philosophical kind of outcome in open source. And people always think that, yeah, like it's like one's better than the other. I actually think like, you know, because proprietary software doesn't have the incentive to evolve forever. I like if I was a proprietary software provider, I would want my code to kind of go out or that open source code to kind of go out and get developed because 
then you're allowing a like a much bigger pool of people to develop stuff that you could then kind of you know build into your products if you want it and then you have to figure out an incentive and in how do you actually get your users to go hey you could go use this open source software and it might cost you whatever one tenth but if you use our product yeah you know, this is all the stuff that we add to it and and then it makes it better and on and all of that stuff right um because one of the criticisms about like open source and you mentioned it kind of like when QGIS first came out yeah, it was a disaster, right? Like, yeah, it yeah. barely ever, like, it barely held its shit together. Uh, like, yeah, there were always like problems and things like that. And that's and that's the curse of of open source is that it's not always a finished product. And that's kind of what the proprietary software companies do. Well, that's what they pretend they do. There's no such thing as a finished product. The only time you have a finished software is in two two instances. One, it's abandoned. It's finished in the sense that you just let <laughs> let it go. And the second time is it goes into a hundred million dollar probe to Mars. And that's the only Correct. time where you have finished software that is yeah. actually where it has to work every single time, every like all the and, time. And, and, uh, that's it. Because the reality of software engineering is that software is always a work in progress. Now, the main contribution, uh, the first things first is that as I as I said earlier, you're never really running truly proprietary software unless you wrote a bunch of code, very low level code on your own machine, right. yep. you're not running proprietary. So you're mostly running open source software. So the open source culture it has made proprietary software more stable over the t over time because, because open source can endlessly improve itself, Correct. even if the original developers are not around anymore. That's one of the number one uh, uh, num number one aspects of it. Something can be uh, can be uh, uh, abandoned by one and and taken over by another with minimal or no real uh, uh, discussion. It's not no transfer of IP. That makes total sense, right? Because yeah, like you develop like you know you develop something once uh, and then say like yeah. Like yeah, you were you were working for a proprietary software provider. You know, you're limited by the number of developers you have and the number of things you can do. But if that code kind of goes out, then yeah, like you have a thousand people kind of hammering it and making it better or killing it. Yeah, you know, like and that and that's totally okay as well. Where you go, you know, like we tested this feature. This is actually not the best feature to develop. We should actually go down some other path, which will which will make these feature better or this code better, etc. So I think that like rate of testing improves a lot a lot faster because you have a much wider community that's that's doing stuff. And that's for sure. You get a lot more feedback. You get a lot more people breaking a software. And the more people break a software, as all software can be broken, the better it is for its uh, overall stability. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, for example, being able to provide an income as a software as an open source software development company. Uh, there's different ways, you know, you can do it. You can do it via direct uh, de development is that basically uh, your clients are directly financing engineering, yep. uh, which you do when you are, when you are, uh, when you are uh, pur pur purchasing a, a license to a software, you are funding some engineering, maybe 5%, <laughs> that's being generous, yeah, yeah. Is, is going into development, which is the main difference for me between the two. Let's say, because oft, often open source software for industry users is not less ex, is not necessarily less expensive, uh, especially in the early days. It's not uh, when, when a, a new solution or is, is, is being developed. It's not necessarily less expensive uh, because developers need to be paid to actually develop, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the main difference is that when you are uh, purchasing a software that is a legacy product that's been going around for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, a proprietary product, uh, there's a very, very tiny fraction of that is going into any uh, uh, improvement of, of that product. And there's no way to say it's complete or it's finished or it's anything. It's not. It's not because otherwise you wouldn't, in the, for example, in the case of a uh, 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 GIS industry, then there wouldn't be a QGIS to actually come and disrupt things if it was like set in stone and it's done and it's, we, we don't need to actually make any improvements anymore. So what happens is that over time, uh, when you purchase proprietary software, the, 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 the ratio of that basically income that comes into uh, the proprietary vendor's uh, account is, 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 is less and less dedicated to further development. And that's because they don't have an incentive to do so. When you are working with a company like Aslandia, for example, we are purely, and there's about dozens of other companies that are similar to Aslandia in the QGIS, uh, let's say, ecosystem, you are basically directly funding engineering. You're going to state your needs 
and we are going to estimate how much time it's going to take and therefore how much is going to cost and then we're going to produce whatever we agreed uh, uh, on and by doing this you have you don't have that effect so if you choose to keep funding it it will keep improving and it will keep improving on the basis of what you are funding whereas you know that you don't have to be hoping that it that, the, that, that it gets there right? this feature or that feature is is being developed and i say that's the value proposition of open source for industry users it's not necessarily that you're going to i mean you're going to reduce costs but in different ways you're going to reduce costs in terms of uh, you don't have to faff around with license servers and pro and 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 uh, for example you only go through procurement once you 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 have this you know these complicated bureaucratic structures in large companies and what happens is that you have this one development contract once the actual end product is available then you are able to do to use it with as many times as you want you can install it on as many machines uh, as you'd like you don't have to go through some other you know uh, you don't have to jump other other hurdles so this goes back to your question i mean i think yeah like maybe and i think it's a very important point you made around industry looking at this uh, like the value proposition that in industry should look at this you know it's not necessarily a a pound for pound comparison that you're going to save money by switching to open source yeah you might end up paying the same amount but the money that you are putting forward has what the word that you use a lot more agency exactly right? you are you can spend it a lot better yeah like you're not paying money where you're going, okay, like, you know, I wanted 10 things done this year, uh, somewhere between the years, like, you know, 2022 and 2030, these features will come out in the software, but I really need them today. So what if my money could actually get me to that to that outcome today rather than in, you know, 2028 or 2029 or whatever? Exactly. You're not able to do that in proprietary software. You just don't have that ability. Like if you want some a feature to be added and a special thing to be done in a in I don't know in Microsoft or uh, Office, there's no way. Yeah, forget <laughs> there's about no it. Way. Yeah, like, there's no way. There's no way. Even if you're the know. like, you could be I don't know any even a, a large uh, government agency. There's no way you can just get them to do something for you just like that. It's not yeah, gonna yeah. work. And and uh, that's because now uh, uh, with I'd say 30, 40 years of of uh, of uh, uh, these large proprietary uh, uh, vendors basically working the way they do they have legacy code that is so difficult to maintain that they also get to a point where they don't want to anyway they just or they're not capable of actually uh, uh, doing uh, producing the outcome in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, you know, or it might require like a fundamentally different rewrite of yes. whatever their their infrastructure is or whatever. And they go, yeah, like man, we like you, but yeah, like we're we're not going to develop this. Yeah, like that's just not possible. Absolutely. And in open source, we basically don't necessarily have a choice. Now, there's another way to make money. There's, I mean, there's different ways to make my, uh, money in open source. You can do some kind of freemium thing where. You have an open source base and then you have closed source uh, component. That's what Red Hat did. Red Hat was very successful. I mean, it was the first large open source company in the world was, was Red Hat. And you have the Red Hat distribution, the CentOS distribution that are the uh, uh, the basically open source version of Red Hat, but it has less features. It's less featured. And some of the features of Red Hat slowly trickle down into the open source uh, uh, version. And some of the features that are developed uh, into CentOS by external contributors find their way up uh, into Red Hat. And of course, I'm not removed from CentOS because that's not how the license works. And that's where I want to bring it back is that for this example, fairly recently, Red Hat has taken CentOS closed source. And it's like, oh, so they can claw it back. They can, a company that develops open source mm -hmm. products, if it's not community driven, where there is like uh, hundreds of people involved and the software belongs to no one, they can claw it back. Well, as a matter of fact, they can and they can't. The only thing they can do is state that further developments into CentOS will be closed source, which effectively means we're not contributing to CentOS, we're just contributing to Red Hat. Actually, that's what it truly means. But the Red Hat, at the date it, they, they made that decision, is open source, remains open source, is forked out, and has become a community project effectively. So that's one other thing, is that on top of agency, on top of being able to state, my dollar will do this, and that way I know where it's going and I'm not just throwing money in a pit and hoping that somehow the genie will come out and, uh, and you know, and grant my wish. What will happen is that you, uh, um, 
you know, you know that this software can never be uh, uh, wrestled out of your hands. And now that might sound like a, well, you know, whatever, when I pay, uh, I get it, I'm guaranteed to have it, I pay every year. Well, first, you're not guaranteed to pay every year, you have a bad year, it doesn't matter, you could still survive. This is important for, uh, you know, exploration companies, you know, startups, if open mm -hmm. source is very important for them. And therefore, it is important for the economy in general, because it is where innovation comes from in general, regardless of software. Innovation comes from, you know, lots of startups uh, 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 being uh, uh, founded and being able to actually compete with open source products is important as it actually allows for uh, uh, these companies not to simply die in the bud or just be hammered by overhead costs with, with this equipment. They don't contribute at the beginning, but in a sense, they indirectly contribute just by using it and making the statement that, that, that they use it. The other point is that when you're on open source and you have, let's say, uh, and that is a very, let's, it's a very, it's, it's a specific example, but let's say it's very real. It's gone from being kind of an abstract concept to being uh, 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 real is the idea that when you read the terms of service in a, in a, a proprietary software that you've installed on your computer, you're who, who most reads that? Nobody yeah. reads that. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's not about privacy. Obviously, there's spyware, there's bloatware, there's this, there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fine. This, I mean, it's fine. It's not fine, but let's say it's very well known. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be stating the obvious here. No, what it is is that they, the vendor can almost invariably unilaterally cancel that contract. They can yep. kick you out of being able, because all that you have is a license. Uh, and unlike when you're renting an apartment, or a house, you don't have much rights as a tenant. You don't have much. You, 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 you're not all that well protected. You're as well protected as what you've agreed, uh, what you've signed on. And most software procurement contracts are just about the, the cost and the, the licensing, whether or not you have support with it and this and that. But actually, this can be, uh, and you might think, well, this doesn't happen. They want to keep, they want to retain good relationship with their customers. They're not going to do that. Well, yeah, but sometimes uh, Russia invades Ukraine. And I know I'm kind of bringing it up in this conversation, but sometimes it happens. And sometimes the US government states that GIS is going to be placed on the list of restricted exports. That's hard. Yeah. Or it's like some strategic kind of initiative that says that this is now, uh, yeah, like proprietary or whatever it is. Exactly. And you just uh, sitting on the, you know, Damocles' sword and just hoping that it's not going to fall onto you as well. Fall, uh, it won't happen in the next 10 years. Well, these things do happen. And uh, I, I mean, it's not exactly something that we are, uh, we, we don't, uh, we certainly didn't wish for this to happen, but uh, uh, there's been a, re, uh, a strong uh, regain of interest in, in, in open source following that as some companies have been cut off as suddenly you might be an exploration company and uh, a, a major has a stake in your company. And then it trickles down and then you notice you have X percent of Russian interest in your company actually, and you cut off of using the software. Uh, and, and that creates a situation where you realize you had no sovereignty, which is slightly different from agency. Agency is about my dollar is spent in the way I see fit. Sovereignty is this software is not mine in the sense of the IP, but it is on this compute. Nobody can prevent me from using it. There's no licensing system that prevents me from using it. No politician can do anything to it, even if, in the case of QGIS, say, all developers involved on QGIS have like a, a simultaneous heart attack. We all end up you know, under the grave, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, no, it matters. It make me a bit, you know, be a bit disappointed. But let's say that what, what happens is that you'd still be able to use that software. Other people would still be able to pick up on it. It's not possible to, for it to just be, you, you can't be forbidden from using it. You can't That's be right. placed under any form of penalty for, 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 for using it. And that is extremely important in, the, in a world that is being in, that is increasingly polarized where political posturing is more and more intense and you've got these uh, uh these uh, wars like there was the china us you know uh, 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 uh you know trade war these things affect software too their exports 
and, uh, and and imports and therefore them they they are also they you're gonna you can be under embargo they can be restricted uh, and so on and so forth so there can be sanctions attached to to software exports so because of that open source is in in my opinion open source is guaranteed to keep growing and expanding if only because of that as a matter of, of sovereignty you always have some countries that are not uh, in agreement with one another. They don't see eye to eye. And because of that, open source is kind of an ultimate neutral territory That's right. that is agnostic to who uses it. So we kind of talked about like the, the benefits of open source, which is just really, you know, like in a way that the distributed kind of a way that it's, that it's owned as well as the way that it's developed. Now, I kind of want to bring you back to what you guys do in Auslandia, where think about this from a, I guess, a, a business point of view. So if I'm Auslandia, how do you create a business where, you know, like the your ability to attract customers, which is essentially people that are wanting you to develop these features, it can be highly erratic. Yeah, so you're like, yeah, it's not like, I mean, maybe obviously like a certain percentage of your customers are going to be recurring. Okay, I, 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 correct on, I correct that immediately. So far, we focused on development. Uh, Oslandia is a service company and we provide a whole range of services that are all in the uh, geospatial open source uh, domain, but there's not only development. You're going to have things like training. People need to be trained on QGIS. We provide that as developers. We can even provide you to develop, for example, plugins, say for QGIS, or even develop in the core of QGIS. If you're a mess of, uh, if you're really, if you're really into this kind of this kind of uh, uh, this kind of thing, uh, we also uh, provide consultancy uh, support. Mm -hmm. You have trouble with uh, the way your geo server is running with your real data. You know, it's like time sensitive data that's coming in real time and it needs to be updated. For example, uh, railway companies that are tracking trains in real time, they use the French railway, uh, uh, national com the national uh, uh, railway company uses the SNCF, uses QGIS, for example. And you might, we send consultants to, 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 to help them. Uh, then you're going to have support, which is different from training. Support is, well, that's actually something I often heard about is in proprietary software, I can, there's a phone, there's a phone number. I can pick up the phone. I can call somebody and, and then tell them that, uh, you know, we provide that we provide corporate support. Well, the difference is that we actually try to fix the problem because we also provide support, which is we will help you with whatever problem you have and, and solve that, which can turn into consultancy in some instances. We also provide uh, maintenance, which is different. It's I have an issue here and there's this bug we will fix it. We have contracts that are like, say you have 10 maintenance items. So every year you can get us to spend X, uh, uh, we'll spend any amount of time to fix these 10 items. I mean, if you found 10 of them while you were doing your, and by the way, there's a scope to it. Okay. You can't just say QGIS is broken, just fix it. It's, it's not an item. Yeah, so we have like a way of defining the scope of what an item is. But these are things that cannot really be in, in proprietary software, uh, uh, in all honesty. But this is, these are some of the services. And the closest thing we have, for example, to, uh, to a, a, a rent, like a, 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 let's say a stable stream of income, it's actually, a fairly, uh, it's actually fairly stable, is going to be support and training. Uh, some companies, they require support and you get users that ask you, how do I do this? How do I do that? And then you spend some hours. And then at the end of the day, you have a contract of say, uh, I don't know, 250 hours. And uh, I, I, we readjust uh, the contract or the rate based on the performance of the previous year. Uh, and then you're going to have a training as large clients uh, have lots of people to train all the times. So think of civil engineering companies, people go come in and out of these companies uh, and you need to be constantly retraining and retraining people. In the mining industry, this is not necessarily all that relevant because the number of people that are going to be relying on, on, on GIS is fairly, uh, is fairly small compared to the total uh, you know, workforce. Uh, it's not the case everywhere uh, in uh, in civil engineering. As a matter of fact, a lot more people are actually using the GIS systems constantly. They need to know where they are. Like that is even the most 
a, a basic uh, a worker needs to know where they are. I'm going to dig here. I need to be in the right spot. So these are, are, are things we provide. We also provide, uh, of course, custom development, which we uh, discussed, which is you have a specific need and you want this to be uh, developed to tailor uh, uh, your needs. It's usually in the form of a, of, of a QGIS plugin. Uh, but you also have core development. We want this to be implemented in general in, in, in the software. Because you have a view that like, yeah, most people, most of your user base are going to require those features or, or need to get to that point or whatever it is. Exactly. So we do have actually a, a, a strong base of, you know, that, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of stable uh, income. And then we have things like what we've uh, launched fairly recently that's for the mining industry. We have open log that is rather than a, a custom development is more generic development targeted to a market. Uh, as a whole, in this case, the, the mining industry for, for open log. And the, the idea behind it is to develop it as a product where you state, this is what we intend to develop for version one. So we intend to develop version two, version three, version four, version five. Do you want to see it? Are you relying on it? Do you want to see it improve? Then fund it to improve. And even if only one company out of a hundred that is using it funds it, it's sufficient to keep it, to keep it going. In the case of generic development, so what is erratic really is the custom development. But custom development is usually something that comes along with some, you know, you can attach some training to it, you can do some other things to it. And then last last is uh, the SAS. For example, you are using something like uh, GitLab, but there's also, I don't know, CRMs or any, there's lots of SaaS applications that are technically open source. You could choose to run them on your own server, had your own uh, IT team handle it, and uh, that costs you a certain amount. Uh, or you can have it run as SaaS, even though it is open source. We can still be running it on our own servers for you. We maintain it for you. We make sure it's online 24-7 and that uh, you know you don't have to to do any of and that, it, and it just works the way you want it to, and all of that stuff. So, exactly. Yeah. That's and it is numerous instances of soft, open source software companies using that, where you have basically the self hosted version. You want to do you want to do it, or you go for uh, uh, the SaaS option. And often it's a matter of scale. Uh, smaller companies will go for SaaS. Uh, self and, and larger company might self-host because they have staff but it, it, it you know it's it depends on how competent uh, people are in, in in your company what your your needs are if you have a really really specific need you might self-host because you have something that needs to be done in a certain way uh, but generally speaking these these are the ways that uh, open source software company can uh, uh, can uh, can generate income without subsidies or, or, or things like that so, so Evelyn, so you sat on both sides of the fence. Yeah, you sat on like um, on the side of a fence where you're a proprietary service provider, uh, like a software provider, as well as a a company that does more open source products. I mean, so what do you find is uh, the the challenge or maybe the the downside to being an open source software provider? I mean, do you find any challenges compared to when you're on the other side? Well, the challenge is the one that you can't simply uh, force people to pay up so that they get to use the software until next year. You're not holding people at gunpoint if you call that a disadvantage uh, because that's essentially it. That's essentially it. Uh, so I'd say that's the main uh, disadvantage. But with the word moving more to SaaS, it's slowly becoming a kind of irrelevant consideration as more and more software is uh, basically web applications running on a, on a distant server. This distinction is less, this is less and less of an issue. Also, when I just want to make it clear that when we develop custom software, because we know a pure open source player, this software is always open source, which means other people will be able to use the software that you have, uh, uh, that you have financed for your specific needs, uh, anybody can use it and we can reuse it, which drives down our cost because we can then readapt it for somebody else, uh, recapitalize uh, essentially on, 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 on this code. Uh, and I know that some, the, the question that comes right after that is, but aren't people going to be frustrated that what their finance is going to be uh, of use to somebody else? And my answer to that is the same in proprietary software. I mean, your other option is proprietary, right? 
So you're funding anyway, something that's being used by other people. And if we develop something custom for you, uh, it's custom for you. So it's, you know, my argument to that is I think anyone that makes that uh, like argument sincerely, I think, yeah, you got to look maybe just one order deeper. You'd be surprised. That's the number one thing I have to face is why would we fund something that other people can use? And my answer is always in proprietary software, you're buying the software. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you buy a license. Other people can do that too, but they have to pay. And it's and then it becomes a, a kind of a real, it kind of becomes irrelevant because if we develop something specifically to fit your needs, what are the chances it fits exactly the needs of company Y that is, you know, exactly the SOP, their way of work? It, it's unlikely. Yeah, like even the other point of it is like, yeah, like if someone ever asks, like if someone legitimately ever asks the question, why should we pay to develop a tool that other people can use? My answer to that is really simple is because other people will pay to develop tools you can use. Like We're not talking about two, uh, in the mining industry, you're not talking about two, I don't know, uh, Italian restaurant on the same street right across and they're direct competitors you know to the same uh, uh client and uh, the client is sitting in the, in the middle of the street and you know switch, you know switching back and forth which way where, where do i go <laughs> that's, right. that's not what happens yeah. when you're sitting on a let's say you're an operator you're sitting on your on your mind side it's up to you to manage that properly to make a profit it has nothing to do with your competitors and when you're an exploration company you found a tenement it's up to you to run your uh, uh, the, the exploration job properly to uh, uh, and maybe there's something maybe there isn't but the point is if there is something it's up to you to to run your job properly and and, and another answer to that is if what's important was the software uh then you've got lots of people that you should let go because normally what's important is the brain uh it's the Correct. person sitting yeah, on yeah, that right. chair if the only thing was that clicking on that button was all that mattered, oh boy, I mean, you don't have a job. <laughs> yeah, like we could get monkeys to come around, to sit around and do that. Like, exactly. yeah, that, that's not really where the incentive part exactly. is. Exactly. So, Evren, uh, we're getting close to the end of our kind of interview mm -hmm. now. Um, so we always ask our guests two questions right at the end. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what is something that you think needs to die in in our industry? Uh, now you can make it as the mining industry or even just uh, like, you know, something that you're involved in kind of the software development or the open source kind of industry. So what is an idea or concept of behavior that needs to die, something that we need to get rid of? Uh, well, I'd say one thing that really needs to uh, go away is decision making when it comes, well, I mean, it's going to be about uh, you know about uh, software uh, software procurement. Obviously, it's misusing software for only a fraction of what it is meant to do. So having lots of users be only using five percent of the capabilities of of a software that drives up you know uh, 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 costs. Uh, uh, trem tremendously and prevents innovation essentially but uh, so that's one thing that really in my mind uh, uh, really in my mind needs to go now this is i think there's many more important things but from my point of view where i'm standing that's mm -hmm. the one thing i think it's a good that one. i can see is that when you have people using full-fledged uh geological modeling packages they can do resource estimation they can do geophysical inversion they can do you know the whole bunch of, of things and all that they're doing is uh plotting points a, a point cloud in 3d and that's you just think what what's going on here why is that why do you have to put up with all that that, that clunky mess uh yeah, when yeah. this software but just a, such a specific or small use case exactly yeah, that is something all. that you can see all all across uh, uh the industry is uh not having properly scoped out the you the needs and just going for the one like one size fits all kind of logic and i'm just gonna give them the tool that does everything but all that you're doing really is you're being played uh, uh, when when you're doing that, I think that's a good point. I think that's an excellent one. I mean, so conversely, last and last question: um, What is something that you think needs to uh, be maintained uh, in the industry? Like, yeah, something that we can't live without. That's fundamental to our kind of DNA. I think uh, that what the industry needs most 
is to put off your put off the blinkers not be stuck into only what happens in our industry the mining industry is fairly uh is fairly walled in let's call it that fairly fairly sheltered you need the especially decision makers and even if you're not a decision maker you are just a geologist you're logging core or you are you know sitting next to a drill all day long and you've got some ideas and you found some things out there that could serve your needs better try to you know push it um and if you're a decision maker don't you know uh silence these voices they're not being negative they actually are positive voices that are trying to improve things for 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 your company and i think the mining industry tends to be kind of uh, 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 stuck in a certain way of, of, of doing things. And when it comes to, uh, it's not only software, uh, software tools, really, but when it comes to, uh, uh, to keeping your, maintaining your competitive uh, advantage in a, in a game where it's all about the efficiency. I mean, the, you know, you want to, you make money with a mind by being efficient, you know, by, you know, you, you, you try to, decrease your uh, operating costs as much as possible to get as much value of mm -hmm. what you can actually uh, produce. So you, that's what needs to be done. And uh, the general, let's say the, don't turn this into some kind of uh, generational conflict is that uh, a younger geo coming up and making, you know, this kind of proposal is not challenging anybody's authority. That's not what they're trying to do. It's just they probably noticed there was something they could do as side fast that this should be, you know, uh, uh, valued. Whether it's open, whether it's software, and it turns out the more efficient thing is, you know, open source or not, that's an important, that's irrelevant. It's 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 more uh, about that. The mining industry tends to be very slow, and you can see some practices that really are half a century uh, 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 old, and mm -hmm. they're still in this, and they haven't really developed beyond that that point in all yeah i mean one example has nothing to do with software for example is having electric electric uh, uh trucks go you know when you are in uh, electric gear in general uh electric powered uh, uh you know equipment that is going to be used uh in underground mining my mine sites it just solves a lot of the uh you know ventilation issue and you, you increase safety a lot mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this was fairly obvious. And in my mind, it's just starting on some pilot sites, starting to be a thing. In all honesty, it should have been done 20, 30 years ago, honestly. We could have done it not mm -hmm. with batteries because it's just a cable. A cable. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be on a battery at the end of the day. It could be, a, you know, you could just have some electrical wiring going down there. And then you have a much more, and then you have your own power plant on site. It, you know, and and by doing this, you, you you're improving safety, and uh, you also are decrease you're decreasing uh, you're decreasing costs by, by doing so. And the only reason why it was not, really, you know, I, there's a, there's technical hurdles, but it is fair to say it took a while because of habits, and I think habits uh, needs to be checked constantly. And a habit should not be misconstrued into a procedure. The habit should not become a procedure without a proper review of why it should be one. And even if you have procedures and ways of doing this, you should review them on a regular basis to make sure you're still up to scratch. And 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 and, and that is what needs to be uh, to, to 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 be encouraged. I think that's a great point to end on. All right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Well, this was great. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for uh, taking the time to uh, you know have me uh, kind of ramble on open source. Oh, an that's afternoon. Right. That, that's all right. We'll we'll cut all your ramblings down oh. and edit them in uh, post production, so it's fine. It's all it's all good. All right. But no, I, I think I think it's good. Yeah, like I, I think it's interesting. Um, and I kind of made this point before. I think we we formally started recording. Yeah, like one of the reasons why I kind of like what you guys are doing is that I think it's a different way to solve uh, a problem uh, or a frustration a lot of people in the industry have. And and I think. Yeah, like to, to your last point, um, you know, we should be encouraging a lot more of this kind of kind of thinking, or at least, you know, like 
irrespective of whether Auslandia or you personally end up being successful in this endeavor, I think the fact that you're giving it a shot and trying to bring uh, these solutions to the industry, I, I think is a good thing because I think it's it's kind of expanding our like our knowledge base to to see that there are different ways to kind of do this. We don't have to be stuck in this kind of, yeah, so, you know, like we talked a lot about software, you know, we don't necessarily have to be stuck in this kind of one, like, you know, simplified, you know, non uh, optimized kind of outcome. You know, we can, we can't test the boundaries to see how, how we kind of do it. You know, maybe, maybe the best solution for software and mining will actually come from outside the mining industry. It might come from somewhere completely different, right? Uh, yeah, but, but we should be a little bit more open-minded and kind of test these things. And and I think, yeah, like to your point, I think one last thing I'll kind of add to it is that I think in the industry, you know, we're sometimes um, uh, a little bit afraid of the fact that these efforts might uh, result with nothing, you know, like it might end up in a failure or, or a null outcome. And I reckon, you know, stuff it. Like, I think, yeah, like we, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So we should try these things to see whether they actually end up into a better world. And if, and if they do, great. And if they don't, uh, then, you know, like we'll learn something out of it. I can't remember the name of the movie director who said that, you know, um, do something. Yeah. If it's good, we'll use it. If it's bad, we'll fix it, but do something. Yep, yeah. And I think that's kind of the, the idea is like, let's just try it and then see how, how it improves or, or, or where do we get to at the end? You're right. And when it comes to uh, open source, you have a double incentive to do so because it is open. If you finance proprietary software development, which happens sometimes, you know, a company is going to finance this startup to develop this. And in the end, they finance the startup and then the startup sells them licenses like you're paying twice what was already supposed to be right. yours, but whatever. And I don't know. I'm not the one who signs off these deals. But what happens is that in open source, even if it didn't pan out, the code is out there. It's not like right. it can yeah. just collapse with a company. And if nobody buys up that IP, it's gone forever. It's, that's one of the major points is that you, even if it doesn't, everything, you know, even if it doesn't work out, there's this uh, a guarantee that whatever it is that was produced is there for all uh, uh, for all to see and you are able to react early on with open source because you can see it being developed over time and it's not behind closed doors and all that you ever get to see is uh, a bunch of demos from time to time that are of course engineered to look good and then at the end of the day you realize the whole thing was a mess open source is open from the start so you're able to just run it on your own machine very quickly and even though it's unfinished and obviously some things are broken you know as long as you understand the concept of an alpha so this is an advantage that you have in, in, in open source is a clear box development. You can see what's happening because we don't, ha we don't need to hide it uh, because it's, it doesn't make, uh, well, we just don't do that. It's open source. It's not something that we worry about. Uh, and another point is that when you consider security, as it is something, and I'll be my last point, is uh, that often you have this concept of a, uh, Oh, the problem of security in open source. Is there some flaw, security flaw in open source software? Well, first, as we mentioned, the, the overwhelming majority of I'm not, I'm not sure proprietary software is as, as secure as people think so it is. So first, uh, but let, let, let's, let's be nice. Let's start with the point that, oh, yes, open source is uh, inherently less safe, let's say. Well, mm -hmm. the truth is that now the overwhelming majority of proprietary code relies on open source technology. So, you know, it's kind yeah, of irrelevant, yeah, just... but let's say, so, that, so even if it was true, it doesn't make sense, but actually it's not true because there's the last point is a scrutiny. You have scrutiny to open source software. And there's a good reason why all cryptographic algorithms are open source. Would you trust me if I told you, oh, I have a way to encrypt your data such that, you know, uh, nobody can intercept any communications you have with another person. Uh, it's, we're using our smart uh, proprietary secret algorithm. No, you don't trust me at all. Uh, 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 are you going to tell me? No, no, no. I, I want to know. I want GP. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, the, the, the price of your services before you encrypt it will be $1 and after you encrypt it will be $1,000 because now like, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that would be a pretty good business model. Yeah, well, <laughs> that sounds like racketeering, honestly, at this point. But, <laughs> that's but basically, you know, you get into this, uh, uh, this situation where you, when you describe any safety critical 
uh, uh, software. It has, it is open source because it has to be open to the scrutiny of uh, security researchers and things. People think, oh, right, you're going to have a, a proprietary code, so people can't see the code, so people can't find the, you know, the issue. No, of, of, of course they can because there's no review. Basically, I mean, the review is is too limited in scope. You don't have. You are basically putting hurdles to uh, the security researchers to actually inform you of the issues that you have in your code, but you're certainly not placing hurdles on hackers who are not trying to understand the flaws definitely and, and provide remediation for them, which is much takes a lot longer. They're just trying to brute force and by brute force, I'm not saying that they're gonna brute force as a brute force attack, but I, what I mean is they're gonna gonna try hundreds and hundreds of known flaws they're gonna just go for them until they find the one that is uh, right for them or they'll decompile yeah, your code yeah, if it has a weakness code. or something like that that's how I'm... so it's 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 a it's it's a it's a moot point as a matter of fact and uh, we know it because uh, basically nobody trusts a security software that is uh, that is uh, uh, i mean security protocols secure protocols have to be open source nobody will trust them otherwise it's uh, it's just we have to trust this one random company. No, <laughs> no, 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 exactly. Um, well, I, I, I think we we gotta let you go, Everin. But thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, this was great. It was great to chat to you about the the, the work that you guys are doing at Auslandia and your passion for open source. It was great. Well, thank you very much. I was happy to share. And uh, of course, if uh, people want to get involved in uh, some of our projects, they can, you know. Uh, reach out to us either by mailing me directly, you know, so everyone at Auslandia, uh, uh, dot com, or if they're interested in open log, all you got to do is type open log Auslandia on your search engine. And uh, then you'll, you know, you'll, uh, you'll be able to uh, get to the landing page uh, uh, to the project. Feel free to try it. Uh, if you try it, we'd like, you know, we appreciate feedback. And uh, even and if there's bugs, tell tell. Oh us yeah, tell us. Them. Don't just you know don't don't you know don't just mourn at the screen. Just actually tell us about it, and uh, you know share the good word. Even if you can't, even if you are not able to contribute or you don't have the authority to get you know your company your organization to contribute, share the good word. Show it to others. That's how open source thrives. It 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 thrives mainly. We don't have you know large marketing budgets. We try to put as much as we can of the uh, as much as we can into actual development work. So what we do is that we mostly rely on the fact that open source can spread freely. So you know help us spread it, even if you're not able to uh, uh, to participate. If you think it has value for you, or you think it might have value for somebody else. You know, let them know. They'll appreciate it. We'll appreciate it. And we'll be, you know, everybody's better off uh, uh, at the end. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next time, uh, Ahmed. I suppose maybe in, at IMARC. Yeah, I'm um, sure. Um, yeah, you and I have a habit of running into each other yeah. at major conferences. Uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll look out for you at the next one that I attend. All right. Yeah, you, you'll be able and we always seem to run into each other at some aisle as we are walking uh, in opposite directions. Uh, let's see if we can keep that streak up. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, when it comes to iMark, we'll be, uh, we have a booth at iMark. So you'll, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I think you'll, it will be the only booth where there is a QGIS logo. So it's not going to be all that difficult, <laughs> you know, to, to figure it yeah. out. So, uh, but I'm, but now there we go. Any, any of our listeners that are at iMark, uh, yeah, you can obviously go and have a chat to everyone at the booth. Um, just look for the logo. Yeah, exactly. It'll be that that big green QGIS uh, logo. It's booth B26. Uh, normally, it's the collab Anglo American sponsored collab arena at the uh, on the trade show. That's where we. Uh, that's where we. Uh, we at and we can. Casey, you have a lot more details than I thought you were going to have. So well done. Oh, it's just I was in the process of you know filling all these boring forms for the conference. You know about you know ah, insurance okay. and, and you know who's in charge. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah you know, <laughs> who the blame should be pinned on in case something goes wrong. And uh, I think to tell them that That's there won't right. be any naked flames on the booth or something like that. I don't know what people do and why they have to ask these questions, but whatever. 
Wow, maybe, maybe you should have them. Yeah, that that would make your boots stand out. I'm pretty but, sure uh, some. I'm pretty sure some people try to have barbecues on the trade show, and it's an Australian conference after all. So you'll have the barbie at some point. It doesn't really matter if you barbecue what's on the grill or barbecue the booth next to you. Yeah, <laughs> as long as it, uh, as long as there's a fire there, but we're, we're happy for sure. For sure, it happens. And I mean, they, they, you know, only in Australia you see people just like. So many people they're just handing over beers, beers, beers like at past 3 p.m. It's just giving away beers just like that. I never you don't see that in Europe. I just gotta tell you, sorry, we're a bit kind of a more tame. But hey, thanks again, man. Thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully you get some good feedback out of this. Hope so. And uh well, thank you, Ahmad. Thank you, Sean. Get to everyone. Cheers. This episode of Expression Radio was brought to you by Mark Salim and Steve Beresford. Produced and edited by Sean Jeffrey and recorded remotely in September 2022. Exploration Radio is supported by the AIG, the One to One Group, and the ASA, and is an official media partner of the 2023 PDAC Conference. Until next time, let's keep exploring.